All right. Uh, after uh, after a, a first panel where a, th a theme around the role of tech uh, as, a, as a new uh, collaborator, new encroacher uh, into the field of urban planning and urban arts practice was raised, uh, our hope was that this panel would complicate what we think tech might mean in thinking about online and offline connections across digital communities. And so I'm very pleased that my colleague uh, Nicholas de Monchot from the uh, School of um, Environmental Design and the Department of Architecture agreed to chair the panel. Nicholas, some of you may know, uh, is both a, uh, an architect, designer, and scholar. His most recent book, uh, Space Suit, Fashioning Apollo, uh, is out with MIT Press. And uh, Nicholas's own uh, design practice has been supported and exhibited in a variety of distinguished locations, including the Venice Architectural Biennial, Spur, SF MoMA. And I'll just note that he's the most uh, recent recipient of the Rome Prize as well. Uh, we're, I'm going to let him introduce the panel, but I hope you'll join me in welcoming Nicholas. Thank you, Shannon. Th that guy sounds pretty impressive, but um, I'm afraid you're stuck with me. Uh, the, uh, so um, I'm delighted to uh, uh, introduce a really strong panel of uh, commentators and contributors around the theme of uh, technology in the public space of the city. Uh, uh, we have, um, uh, uh, we are very fortunate to have, as a kind of, as a respondent to the panel, Marina McDougall, um, a, a curator and uh, the uh, director of a new center for art and inquiry at the Exploratorium in San Francisco, um, Jake uh, Levitas, the re uh, formerly research director and maybe once again research director at the Gray Air Foundation for the Arts, and um, uh, currently in a one-year residency um, uh, at the San Francisco Mayor's Office of Technological Innovation. Uh, and lastly, uh, Joel Slayton, the executive director of Zero One, the, the truly uh, groundbreaking uh, uh, um, uh, festival and biennial of uh, technology and culture in San Jose that has a, a kind of uh, reaches a global audience from um, what is actually the largest city in the Bay Area. Uh, so the, the um, uh, I, I would, uh, my own work uh, uh, in, in technology and public space in the city um, uh, leads me to want to contextualize this panel uh, a little bit in the context of something which um, I'm not sure anyone in this room may know ab uh, about, but I would uh, 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 call to all of your attention what is currently an enormous effort, a, a multi uh, hundred million dollar effort by uh, large uh, corporations by universities like NYU and the University of Chicago to resuscitate a notion of the city that was uh, 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 very much in, um, uh, in, in, in conversation in uh, about 20 or 30 years ago as something that can be uh, instrumented, organized, and made entirely transparent or susceptible to technological analysis, whether it's the Smarter Cities program um, uh, and marketing program of IBM and also Siemens and Cisco and others, the, the uh, Center for Urban Science and Progress, $100 million uh, new effort at NYU, chaired by a physicist. Uh, uh, and the, the, there's a kind of, um, uh, uh, for all that technology does do in our infrastructure and for all of the, of the good people with noble efforts that are involved in these kinds of affairs, we're encountering once again a notion of the, of, um, the city as what Jane Jacobs called a collection of file drawers, something that can be kind of organized and analyzed and arranged, um, uh, and particularly through the medium uh, of, of technology. And of course, this is not what the city is. Uh, and uh, I think our conversation this morning is, um, uh, is an attempt to uh, not so much provide a kind of rebuttal to this larger vision, but to articulate a very different uh, uh, vision for technology in the city, uh, one that I would uh, uh, one that is more emergent, one that is more uh, culturally engaged, uh, disruptive, uh, uh, and seeks to uh, empower those who might not otherwise have power in urban conversations versus to, to serve a kind of top-down uh, administrative, fundamentally administrative methodology. Um, and in that regard, I, I think it's also really interesting to, to note historically that, in fact, um, uh, 
technology, uh, much as we think of it as a kind of scientific and engineering discipline, is actually itself primarily a cultural artifact. And uh, uh, not only that, but much which we uh, embrace and enjoy and which makes conversations like this one possible about the possibilities of emergent, uh, uh, clear, legible um, uh, uh, technology is actually, uh, in its own very important way, um, uh, a product of the urban culture of the Bay Area. Uh, uh, which in the 1960s uh, uh, and 70s articulated a vision of technology and its possibilities uh, uh, by Stuart Brand and others uh, uh, that um, many uh, of the kind of most engaging and enriching technologies that we currently in encounter in the city are fundamentally based in. So um, I'll leave my remarks there. And then um, I will ask, uh, uh, I think it's best for us to stay seated so we can actually see what each other is talking about. And then after um, uh, Jake and, and Joel have spoken, then uh, we'll all come, uh, all come up and uh, I'll hand the mic over to Marina and then to everyone. I would make one last note. Um, uh, uh, as we, uh, we have great hopes for this conversation, both uh, uh, as it's shared online and as we encounter each other, to lead to other things. And so it would be great if when you ask a question, you not only identify yourself, but uh, if it is the case that you're here on behalf of an organization or would like us to associate you with some larger group of people, then um, let us know uh, what that organization is or who you are in the larger sense, and, uh, and we can follow up with you uh, as a result. So thanks very much, and I'll leave it for, for Jake to begin. I think Joel's going first. Oh, or maybe Joel. I've misplaced myself. I can go first, too. <laughs> go ahead. As you yeah. All right. So many of you know the biennial. Uh, the Zero One Biennial, which was in its fourth iteration this uh, past season. Um, Zero One has commissioned over 600 artists from 60 countries from around the world to be here in Silicon Valley with us to showcase their works at the intersection of art and technology. And simultaneously, we take very seriously our relationship to uh, the region and the community and the artists who are producing work here as well. Um, we opened our new facility down in San Jose this past year in conjunction with the biennial. Um, we uh, went through all the trials and tribulations that I think you heard a little bit about in terms of you know, acquiring a building and renovating the building and building the place and they will come scenario. And uh, we can talk about that, but I'm not going to go into details of it right now. Um, the, the primary thing about, uh, to, that I would like to make a point about is that from my um, prerogative and vision for the space, it's not so much that it's an yet another presenting arts organization, because God knows we don't need one, but really it is a platform for developing a deeper discourse around particular issues, and it serves as a kind of hub for an expanded network. This past year's biennial had 45 institutional partners throughout uh, the Silicon Valley area. Um, including 15 in San Francisco and, of course, here in Berkeley as well. Um, so we have a particular interest in how arts organizations can uh, serve to enable this particular region, and specifically San Jose, to be a canvas on which artistic experimentation can take place that really begins to look at a variety of issues and bring the artist to the table. Um, to talk about ways of strategizing uh, new alternatives, providing a pro provocation and a critique on a range of issues from the environment to societal. What I wanted to talk about today, however, is something a little, a little different. Um, it's useful to this conversation to think about a little bit of forecasting. Now, in forecasting, you know, it's not a prediction. I'm not suggesting that I know or anybody knows, you know, how this is all going to turn out. We don't. But I think we could all essentially agree on the sort of general principle that these two ideas are going to happen. Radical connectivity is a reference to a transformation that we are experiencing now from the Internet of Things to the internet of reciprocity. It's not going to be the same in 10 years. 
this thing that we've you know, invested uh, an enormous amount of energy and time in is really going to look radically different. And the primary reason for that is the cloud. And the cloud changes the paradigm because it, we move from a culture of technological transactions to a culture of reciprocity, a culture of partnerships. When you can imagine having supercomputer data delivered to your mobile device, it changes the nature of everything. Infinite data is this reference to this idea that there's simply more data being generated than we can assimilate. It's being generated faster than we can do anything with. And so the idea of searchable data, of uh, data that, that we somehow have a one-to-one -one control over is an obsolete idea. Infinite data is going to require that we are dynamically, interactively, participatory, and engaged with it in real time. And these things change the dynamic. Um, and so it's useful to a conversation like this one to think about how the artist operates as a, a, as a kind of a provocateur doing things today, doing things now, that are not about predicting the future, but sort of testing it and exploring it, playing with it. So an image, uh, this image is from uh, uh, one of the artists we featured in the, in the, bi the biennial, and uh, Anthony Bertol, and um, it, you know, it begins to look at this set of alternatives for what this connectivity and participation and engagement with the public might look like. So at zero one, we're concerned with the now. Specifically what artists are doing to explore, provoke, and enable conceptual foundation upon which these futures can be tested. And of course there's not one future, there's many futures. Many narratives to be played out. And of course how public space can be shaped by data and how data shapes public space. So this is the Richard Meyer architecture um, in, uh, for the City Hall building in downtown San Jose. This was the first project that we commissioned for the biennial by Akura Hasegawa from Japan, which enveloped the entire architectural structure in a field of algorithmically projected um, you know, visualizations. So as you glanced at the building, it was slowly but surely transforming in real time. And it was a data, it's an example of a kind of data-driven project that sort of pointed to a direction about the nature of liquid architecture. It doesn't literally become liquid architecture, but it sort of begins to point at, at uh, ways of thinking about that, that particular um, issue. The point here is also is that doing these kinds of projects requires a huge amount of negotiation and partnering in order to accomplish them. So you're working across you know, the city, you're working across economic development, you're working with stakeholders, you're working with vendors, you're you know, in-kind providers of resources, et cetera, to be able to create the platform in which something like this can happen. This is data growth by Future Cities Labs here in San Francisco. Um, it renders the invisible visible and takes sort of this no notion of invisible data, which is primarily atmospheric phenomena, and it creates variable intensities of light as you interact with it and sort of creates a shelter in an open public space that you can kind of begin to interact with. So this is staged at the uh, 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 California Theater in their uh, courtyard in downtown San Jose, which is a, one of the old 1929 movie houses. So it took a space that was really not utilized very, very much at all and created a really dynamic, interesting place to converge and interact with the, with the public. We also have this issue of there being, as uh, uh, Nicholas pointed out, you know, San Jose is the 10th largest city in, uh, in the nation in terms of population. It's very spread out, as you well know. Um, but there are 6,000 tech companies in San Jose, just San Jose. That's not Sunnyvale. That's not, you know, <laughs> that's not our neighbors. Um, 6,000 tech companies. It still is um, the center of the universe for many of the uh, global companies that, that uh, are, have prospered and contributed so tremendously to this, this area. Um, this is a project by Mark Hansen and Jer Thorpe. 
uh, before us as the salesman's house. It was commissioned for this past year's biennial. And it's an investigation of, the, of eBay as a kind of cultural artifact. Um, and it ties together text and objects and transactions that are pulled directly from visualizations and, uh, uh, from, of data from both eBay and PayPal in real time. And it branches into the company to create and reveal the societal trends of transactions. Um, the project is a kind of open-ended work. It's framed around the exploration of geographic and temporal patterns of purchasing. And it explores the eBay, makes visible the eBay ecosystem. And it's anchored in excerpts from Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. So it uses text from, from the, from the uh, first chapter to then make a determination on, on a particular item. And then it visualizes the item as it transacts itself throughout the population of PayPal. I cannot tell you how difficult it was <laughs> to get PayPal to open its data stream. <laughs> but they did it, right? And they did it. And I think that's the point, is that in this case, we're actually delivering the, the art installation to the entry of the eBay campus in, in uh, San Jose. Um, another group we've worked with is Blast Theory from the UK. Um, really incredible work in participatory cinema that utilizes the canvas of the city as a stage upon which a live action drama is played out where the audience members become actors in a narrative that unfolds via mobile phone and is viewed over the web. And an incredible uh, experience if you haven't uh, done something like this, where you're, you're immersed in a film and you're not sure who are actors and who are not actors. Um, you're getting instructions to engage and interact with people on the street and go to certain locations and perform certain actions. And, um, it really becomes a completely immersive experience that blends this virtual and physical space into one. In, into one. This is the, a new work. Um, it's actually a simulation. You're the first to see it. I probably shouldn't even be showing it, <laughs> but what the heck. Um, we're working with Ante Vijay from France on a new project through our fellowship program at Zero One, which is a year-long opportunity for artists to sort of do research, develop a prototype, and uh, outcomes around a particular innovation challenge. Anti VJ is a world-renowned projection mapping artist on architecture. You know, I'm sure you know their work. Um, we've commissioned them to actually do something quite different, which is to build or prototype a design for a downtown wayfinding navigation system that will use multiple projection sites and a sensor network that's embedded into the city infrastructure so that pedestrians can be tracked and monitored and interact with the projection environment. It also is a mobile phone, uh, it's, a, it's a development platform which will allow both clients and users to then reshape it over time so that they, the, the public actually can engage in what the outcome of this is, this project is as it evolves over the next four or five years. So it's a really interesting new experiment for us. We have no idea how it's going to turn out, right? And I think that's, that's also the point. It's our job to provide an opportunity and a platform and a canvas upon which the artist can begin to explore. So radical connectivity and infinite data, certainly something for us all to be thinking about. But at the heart of this is also the idea of creating experience and creating, therefore, policy to support those kinds of experiences. So you all know this one, right, because it's in your backyard. Zero One was the fiscal sponsor for the, for the Baylights project. This is an $8 million project, $8 million raised in nine months, all from individual philanthropy, um, 25000 LED lights um, programmed and designed by Leo Villarreal. Leo was a, um, an artist that was featured in um, our first uh, contemporary art biennial in San Jose. Um, so we were really glad to see that that platform popped up and allowed Leo to do something really uh, on this huge scale. This involved so much work behind the scenes, you cannot possibly fathom. You know, the interaction not only with the city, but also with you know, Caltrans and the bridge development and 
you know, environmental issues. I mean, these things just really are deeply complicated behind the scenes in order to, uh, to pull off. And it's a real good example of this notion of reciprocity, where something happens because of partnerships, not because of a single individual. But Zero One is not just sort of focused on these sort of large, large scale um, you know, projects. We're, we're also very much about enabling the small. And this is a project by Carolina Sobrenka um, that involves the, uh, uh, it's called Cloud Machine. And underneath this uh, weather balloon is a uh, system for generating and making clouds. So it actually is lofted into the air. Uh, when it reaches a certain altitude, it um, emits um, a mist that then is crystallized in the form of a cloud. Um, it's also a weather uh, sampling tracking system, so it's looking at and collecting data, which is transmitted back and then uh, analyzed at a later date. And so this is a community-driven project. It brings people together on a volunteer basis in order to have it executed. But again, it involves working with the FAA and figuring out how to do all the things behind the scenes so you don't crash an airplane. Um, you, you likely have seen the Stamen Design Project that was, uh, I think, it is also at the Exploratorium, but uh, it's been received quite a bit of press this past year, of tracking the private bus line network that leaves San Francisco and transports technology workers to um, the South Bay. And uh, one of the very interesting uh, outcomes of this project was the sort of acknowledgement that tens of thousands of people are hopping on these uh, private network of buses and moving in and out of the city. And we're only here, to ask them, you know, they tracked Apple and Google and Cisco and the primaries. There are a lot more behind this. And this is changing the very composition of what the urban experience is and what these particular locales are um, beginning to tran be transformed. Uh, the real estate values, are up much higher where the bus stops, right? And I think you probably all know that. But 60,000 workers moving in and out of the city every day to, to uh, corporate campuses is also changing the composition of the corporate campus and the way in which those are designed and the transportation networks that feed them. This is Natalie german -Janko. Um, we commissioned Natalie to do a project. We uh, built a wetland marsh for her to simulate uh, personal flight system that she's been designing. Um, the real focus of the project was to build an education center to teach people about wetland reclamation and the impact that airports have had and what the potential of a future would be if we had personal flight aircraft that allowed us to land on wetland marshes that were human manufactured in urban environments. Um, I flew the thing the first time and I actually crashed into that mud swamp. <laughs> a little, or maybe it was a little too heavy for it. But it was, a, it was a pretty amazing project. Or David Rockwell and the Rockwell, Rockwell Lab, and it's again, it's on their city hall building downtown. And this was a participatory um, work that allows individuals to engage and interact with the architecture of the building by yelling at it, stamping on the pavement, um, you know, sending a tweet, uh, you know, both virtual and physical interaction with the building which is cool because then it created this, this beautiful canopy of light that would rise up like an inverted Tetris on, on the uh, architecture. More importantly, Rockwell Lab created an open source software platform for this project that can now be used by architects anywhere for designing building interaction systems. And lastly, um, a project, uh, and, and sort of why I showed you just this few, you know, just a few samples of, of the kinds of work that Zero One's been, been involved with, um, is that one-offs are uh, great, but in the end, this is about building some infrastructure for the future and creating platforms on which can be, that can be reutilized and, and developed out and explored in different ways. Um, in this particular uh, project, eCloud, which is in the, San Jose uh, Mineta Airport. It uses 2,000 panes of glass um, that can you know, that go from opaque to transparent. But essentially what it's doing is sampling weather data and doing a transformation on the canopy of, of uh, the panes as they're distributed in the ceiling of the new terminal. Um, what's important to, to indicate about this is that we had to work with the airport 
from the moment go to build the data pipe, not just for this work, but for all works to come into the future. So there, there is a data pipe that's embedded in the airport that creates the infrastructure pipeline that allows artists to use surveillance data, baggage control data, flight data, all forms of data that are not, you know, that don't interfere with security, uh, obviously, but to create a mechanism upon which the artist can sample and, and utilize and, and explore new opportunities. So, you know, that future of radical connectivity and uh, infinite data is not here. Nobody really knows exactly what it means, what shape it will take, but Zero One is really committed to working with artists now to provoke, challenge, critique, explore, and to start creating platforms on which experimentation for the future can take place. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks to all of you guys for being here. Uh, thanks to Berkeley and all the hosts for having me and for having this panel. Um, thank you to Gray Area, um, where I worked through uh, this April, to a digital art organization in San Francisco, to Intersection for the Arts 5M Project, and the Mayor's Office of Civic Innovation, where, where I'm now a fellow for a year, but uh, I'm not here on behalf of the city or I can't like fix parking tickets or anything. Um, but I hope to talk some about my experience so far on the, on the other side of things, uh, so to speak, w within City Hall. Um, to the urban prototyping teams that I'll talk about in a little bit, to the, and to the artist and friend of mine, George Zisiatis, who uh, created one of the projects I'll talk about. Uh, I really appreciate Joel as well showing so many beautiful real world examples because I'm going to show fewer of those and lots of large words on uh, slides. Uh, I, I'm really excited to be able to talk a little bit more about the conceptual underpinnings of technology and placemaking and, uh, and public art. I think there's a lot of assumptions that are made that we talked about some in the previous panel about um, perhaps new is better or perhaps technology is great uh, or not great depending on your perspective. But I just want to kind of concretely understand a little bit more uh, of what's behind some of these assumptions and uh, hopefully begin a dialogue about this with, with all of you guys. Um, so first of all, a little bit about placemaking, a little bit about technology's role in that, why it's a good idea, why it's a terrible idea, and how it looks in practice. So this is the project by George uh, that I wanted to, to talk about and to begin with. Um, this kind of relatively quietly just got installed in Boston in five different locations. Uh, when, you, when you grab the handles of this, this heart, it uh, plays you an electronic music soundtrack based on your heartbeat, um, flashes lights and colors, and it also is recording your pulse and how many people interact with it in real time and sending that to a server so people can track it. Um, this started about a year ago as an idea. He came to me literally on, on a piece of paper in his notebook, and, and now it's uh, just, just got um, installed on the, on the street in Boston. People are interacting with it every day. It's really exciting. Um, so this is kind of the end of the story. So let's jump, jump back. Um, so uh, has anyone heard this word before? I'm just kidding. We've all heard this word before, and it all means different things to different people, right? Um, so just for my purposes, I'm going to use this definition by Al Zelinka and Susan Jackson uh, Hardin, which is the process of adding value and meaning to the public realm through community-based revitalization projects rooted in local values, history, culture, and natural environment. Surprisingly, this is actually one of the shorter definitions of placemaking you'll come across. <laughs> Um, kind of amazing, but there's, there's this process of placemaking the umbrella, uh, the, the process um, including policy, including um, community feedback, including a lot of other things, and then there's the actual creating of the place, what happens in the physical realm, and that's, that's what I want to talk about. 
Now, so, so some principles of, of what makes placemaking successful from ArtPlace, maybe you guys have seen all of these before, so just um, to, to go through them quickly, um, successful creative placemaking capitalizes on distinctiveness, creates a place where people want to go and linger, contributes to a mix of uses and spontaneous interaction, fosters connections between people, encourages pedestrian activity, all these great things, so let's make it shorter. So, um, Creative placemaking is distinct, diverse, active, social, and engaging. And I think to, to break down these adjectives a little bit more um, is, is an exercise for another day, but I want to talk about how technology plays a role in these things specifically, uh, or could play. So, right, uh, another large word. And creative technology specifically is what I spent the last two years working on at Greary and a lot of what, what Joel touched upon. Uh, about what's really exciting in this new field where artists and, and technology people are, are suddenly talking to each other, you know, coming from very different backgrounds and, and kind of slamming their heads together and seeing what comes out of it. Uh, so there's a lot of hardware projects, there's a lot of software visualization projects, there's a lot of interaction design projects uh, that we're seeing now that, that often are, are stuck in galleries or they're stuck on people's computers or they're stuck online in a one-to-one -one web interface where we're all staring at our own screens and having some interesting experience. Um, but what's interesting is when, when these things are pulled into public space and the kinds of action, interactions that those can create and, and facilitate. Uh, because some of it's actually pretty exciting, and, and if I wasn't uh, sort of sold on part of it, I, w I wouldn't you know, be talking about it. But I I'm also have a healthy dose of, of skepticism for anything that requires me to look at a screen more than I have to. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about a few principles of technology and how they match up to these principles of placemaking. Um, Creative technology can be generative. Um, so it, pardon all of the buzzwords in advance. Um, but I think it's important that we understand what these buzzwords mean. So this means that we can create a new output of a project uh, on the fly you know, as, as we go in real time, every, every single time. We have the same piece of code that creates a different output for every single person in this room. So you can have a, a common visual framework, but actually every output or interaction with it is completely unique. Um, it's adaptable, meaning any, any surface that, that we can imagine, we can put something onto that surface now, and Joel showed some examples of that. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see the different types of, of mediums that, that technology is now playing a role in. We saw uh, a project embedded into a brick wall. You've seen projection mapping. I mean, how, many, how many people have seen or interacted with a piece of digital public art? A lot of people? Okay, that's cool. I don't think that would be as common, maybe like five years ago even, but we're seeing it start to grow, right? Um, it's dynamic, which means we can, we can change it all the time. We can have a surface that looks like a wall one day and, is, and looks completely different the next day and looks completely different the next day, and it's interacting with you know, all of this data in real time, um, as Joel uh, was talking about as well. It's collaborative, so you can have many, many people, many, many people interacting with one piece of art at the same time. And, and I think that's not unique to technology, but it's, it is facilitated at a different scale. Um, for example, having a screen that uh, captures the movements of thousands of pedestrians at once or, or thousands of uh, discussions online happening you know, simultaneously. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can visualize those interactions now in ways that we couldn't before, and we can turn them into sounds, and we can turn them into visuals, we can turn them into music. Um, it's, really, it's really fascinating, and people can have a many-to-many -many relationship with each other rather than a one-to-one -one relationship. So rather than technology only being about screens, once we bring it out into a realm, it becomes collaborative. Um, and it's interactive, so I think this this is like the basic, most basic icon that could represent this, right? But when I do this, something happens uh, immediately, and that's kind of that's kind of amazing. Um, we can use technology to 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 engage with something beyond ourselves, um, and to engage with people beyond ourselves, and I think that's really fun. So why why do these two things match up uh, potentially? Why why is technology relevant to placemaking? Um, at all. Um, so here's all the buzzwords I just used. Um, and they're actually all the same thing. Um, 
So that's kind of the secret, I guess. They're the same. So place making creates places that are, that are unique. Uh, technology creates objects that are generative and unique to every single person. Place making is valuable when it's diverse. Technology creates diversity and adaptability. Place making is, is valuable when it creates active spaces. And technology is dynamic and active, by definition, um, in real time now uh, for however much data we want. Placemaking encourages social interactions and technologies by definition nowadays, social and collaborative. And placemaking is engaging and technology is engaging through its interaction. So I could sort of just stop here and that would be the end. Uh, and it would be kind of a sales pitch for a new type of art in the public realm and championing that um, because it, there's so many possibilities and it's so exciting and uh, it was sort of meant to be in a match made in, in heaven for, for placemaking, but I don't think that's necessarily true. And I, I don't think a lot of you maybe think it's true either. Um, so here's where these things don't match up. Uh, in the definition we had at the beginning, placemaking as, as, as driven by local values, history, culture, and the environment. And actually, one of my favorite films is Koya Niskatsi from 1982. It, it, it juxtaposes so beautifully this uh, uh, black and white divide between nature and cities and uh, machines and industrialization. And um, does it without saying any words at all. And I think we need to understand if these things are, by definition, at odds with each other. Uh, by definition, um, can screens facilitate human interaction? Or should we just be able to walk up to each other on a street and say hello? Um, what world do we want to live in? Um, is this what we want art creation to look like? Uh, is this what we want um, you know, the collaborative like, process to look like? Um, and this was from one of our events. Um, where we did a, a make-a-thon, um, which, was, which was creating a lot of these projects. And, and again, I think it, it was beautiful. People, this isn't what the entire weekend looked like. This is sort of a, <laughs> a selective of, of image. But, but this, is, this is, at the end of the day, you know, people aren't painting. They're not playing instruments. They're, they're all doing something with these screens. Um, and they're doing beautiful things, and they're making incredible magic like behind the screen. But if you're looking at them, um, you know, as we're looking at each other now, you you would have no idea, right? Right? Whether we're on email or like looking up recipes for like stir fry, or creating a beautiful piece of generative art, it's all it's all the same um, from one perspective. And also, this is an image from the Urban Prototyping Festival that that we ran and that Deborah mentioned. Um, this, this industry or this, this medium is also dominated by a specific subset of people. There's a larger barrier to entry than picking up a paintbrush because you have to learn how to code and you have to learn how to solder and you have to understand large sets of data. And um, it's not really intuitive stuff. It's fascinating that these, that these uh, artists are engaging with each other um, and engaging with technology in, in completely new ways and opening up all these possibilities. But do we need another? Uh, do we need the dominant medium or an, or an emerging medium or, or funding at the end of the day, which is limited, to go towards um, you know young male white affluent uh, people who are who are creating art? And it's it's a valid question, and I'm not going to answer it now. <laughs> um, but I think. More so than replacing traditional art, I, I hope that, that these forms can complement each other and that we can learn from each other through dialogue. Um, that when we have discussions about should this wall turn into a mural or should it turn into an interactive like street game performance piece, uh, that those aren't uh, one or the other dichotomies, that, that we can find ways to make these collaborations even more uh, out there, even more radical and interesting. Um, and diverse. So what, is, what does all of that look like? Um, this was a project called Shared Cinema that was at the, the Urban Prototyping Festival. Um, basically, it puts a YouTube jukebox on the wall. And you can pick any video from YouTube you want and watch it with your friends. And basically, the, the idea for this came from dinner parties that um, 
turned into this activity by default. Uh, she said, well, we could do this in the street, and it would be way cooler. Um, so it was amazing. I had my uncle playing at a rock show in 1985 like on the, on the wall in the, in the streets of San Francisco. With my, my parents were there, too, and they were watching it with this together. And it was this very surreal experience. Um, and and you know, if, if movie theaters are dying and if video rental places are dying, is this a, an alternative where, where space is more abundant and um, ways to use it are less abundant? Uh, this was a project called Clip and Slide, uh, which was designed to be actually clipped modular st uh, stairs, basically turning a staircase into slides. We were going to do it in the BART Plaza at Powell Street, and um, they didn't like that idea. Uh, so we built it in a parking lot uh, as a standalone structure. Uh, the team built it. And as you slide down, it lights up and flashes. And kids loved it. Supervisor uh, Jane Kim got on it. That was really fun. And um, you know, it's just like looking at, at new ways to, to imagine space and, and that this technology can uh, you know, feed some of these interactions a little bit. And kids just loved it. It was, it was great. Um, this is a project called Urban Parasol that clips onto any vertical uh, structure in the city. This one was a, a light pole. Um, this is the prototype version. You can actually see the zip ties, like kind of, <laughs> like uh, bouncing off of it in different places. Uh, I cropped the part where they're like running to install it right at the beginning of the <laughs> festival um, because it really was a very this like fast light and experimental type of project. But now it's getting they're working with Paris to turn this into a shade structure um, that that lives in different places in the city of Paris. Um, this project was called Highlights, and it really, I think, emphasizes uh, this, this, this uh, non-dichotomy, non-zero-sum world between digital and, and physical and traditional art. So this, this, pro this team saw this beautiful mural sitting on this otherwise sort of defunct alley um, and said, well, we could, we could turn that into something amazing at night. Um, it's already beautiful, but like, what else could we do with it? And, and, and they made this incredible projection mapping performance. So I, I wish I had a video to show you, but um, it, they mapped the entire uh, uh, mural into vectors, which means they could play with them and, and make them uh, basically an interactive light performance that plays with the lines of the mural itself. And they ended up putting it up there. The artist of the mural uh, walked by and was like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of cool. And then they started talking about it and collaborated you know, even more from there. So you know, at the same time that these alleys are becoming dark and that the murals are becoming less visible or perhaps less impactful, um, they could be complemented with uh, some of this you know, digital augmentation or whatever you want to call it, collaboration. Um, and this project was called I Want to Hold Your Hand. And I, I really love this because it facilitates such meaningful public engagement. Um, there's two steel plates that you can place uh, any distance apart that you want, and you have to complete the circuit by holding people's hands. Um, so, so when when those hands are connected, it creates these beautiful visualizations and um, kind of generative art pieces play and respond to you in the background. So the more people are holding hands with each other, the brighter it gets, and and so on. Um, so you could have you know 300 people doing this if you got enough friends and put them on different sides of a block and. Um, you know, it's just one of these ways where you know maybe technology could create types of interactions that wouldn't be possible otherwise. Um, and finally, back to George's project, Pulse of the City. Um, this was the first iteration. You can actually see sort of the the like welding marks. I think this might have actually been cardboard or paper mache or something. Um, but he he had the plates on. It was working great, and then um, and and. People were able to interact with it, and people from the city of Boston came over and, and saw the potential for this. And you know, this is what it looks like uh, nine months later. Uh, so starting with this prototype and, and turning it into something more refined once you've proven the concept um, is, is how a lot of these projects can be successful. Um, so we really tried out things that hadn't been tried before. Uh, and I think technology lets you do that. That's another one of the benefits. You don't have to paint the entire wall of a, of a building. You can just project something on it and test it out and then do it again the next day completely differently. Um, so these are some more buzzwords and adjectives that you might hear a lot. But I think in practice, they're actually, they're actually happening. And to go from an idea, a sketch on a piece of paper to an installed project um, is really exciting to me. And this is the uh, Mayor Menino in Boston 
playing with it, so it's kind of exciting. Um, but this is kind of the how part too. So if that's like what the actual projects might look like, um, we still have a ways to go in, in understanding how uh, these types of projects can be enabled in the city um, through motivating artists to work on this type of stuff and for organizations to fund and support it and for the city to support it and um, for, for the policy funding and, and necessary dialogue between communities and um, constituents to, to take place. So uh, I'm looking forward to talking more about this with everyone. Thanks a lot. Marina first to, to uh, share her thoughts and then, uh, and then open it up for questions. And we have uh, a nice robust half hour to, to do that all in. Great. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, we just convened a really interesting um, symposium at the Exploratorium last weekend um, that was called Interspatiality. And we were looking at the very early history of um, media arts. Um, some in the late 60s, early 70s, there was a um, flourish of projects that would pair artists with engineers or, or place artists in industry. So some of the famous ones were experiments in art and technology, um, art and technology that was um, organized by LACMA in Los Angeles. And uh, Exploratorium actually opened with an exhibition called Cybernetic Serendipity that was sort of the <laughs> offshoot that was sort of um, a range of people discovering the creative possibilities of the technology. Um, and um, so our, our symposium was looking at you know, the, the possibilities of, of, um, co for collaboration in interdisciplinary context today through the arts. Um, but it really made me think about, in hearing our last two speakers, um, just sort of the, how far we've come 40 years later and how, how different the paradigm is. Um, in the late 60s, the access to tools by artists was really quite different. Um, and the, the, uh, the inspiration for starting something like experiments in art and technology was the importance of the arts in, in changing cultural dialogue. So a good example of this, um, just to think about, is um, a pro actually there's a project Exploratorium ha it currently has on view called Fog Bridge, which is um, a large scale um, fog environment created by um, Fujiko Nakaya, who's a Japanese artist. Um, she's now in her 80s, but her first project was at the Osaka 1970 um, Expo. And she was paired with a cloud physicist in Los Angeles to develop the project. And um, he it, it fundamentally changed the way the cloud physicist, um, it, with the technology that was developed, um, to the fact that today his uh, children are using the same technology, which is basically like artificially produced fog, to cool Facebook's cooling rooms. And meanwhile, um, uh, Fujiko Nakaya has gone on to do these projects around the world that kind of make us think about weather, and in San Francisco, make us think about the fog and, and our relationship to it. They help you sort of see the invisible. So it's just fascinating to me how this one technology um, has these two really different aspects depending on whether it's in the hands of an artist or in the hands of industry. So um, I think that's kind of, I wanted to sort of mention that as a kind of background to what, where we are um, with, with Zero One today and Gray Area Art Foundation and so many other kind of media arts um, groups that are continuing to give access to tools to artists that um, maybe change our imagination of, uh, of for lots of different things. Um, and maybe that maybe that's where I kind of I have a bunch of questions. Maybe Nicholas and I can help seed the the conversation that we're all going to have. But I guess that's um, that's kind of the premise for our discussion today is imagination, and um, and how the arts change imagination. Um, you showed a range of projects that um, some have a kind of a critical quality to them. Um, some of them enchant us. Um, some of, this, some of them might have a kind of a tension with physical space, both in a good way and a maybe, maybe not so good way. Um, but maybe we could start off there with um, kind of the notion of artistic imagination and, and the kind of importance of that. So um, 
it's great to hear the, the, the framing historically because I, I think it's, uh, it's incredibly important for us to understand that this is all part of a, an ongoing discourse that's uh, been emerging for, for a very long time. Um, one of the things that, that I, uh, I guess I personally sort of believe about the role that artists play in this, in this conversation is that although it's not necessarily what their intent is, I think they often anticipate the shape of the future. And that's a consequence of interacting with the context of, of the contemporary world in which they, they operate. Um, it's not that, and I think there just a, there's an endless number of examples where artists have sort of stepped forward very, very early in the game and postulate frameworks and ideas and conceptual, um, uh, you know, conceptual orientations ar around a particular set of ideas. And then 10, 20 years later, we see the transformation of those ideas adopted by and incorporated by industry um, to solve very specific and sometimes really important problems, um, but also sometimes not, right? And it's, it's, one never really quite knows where, that, where that's going to land. But I think it's really important that, that we recognize that there's not one size fits all and that there are many, many different kinds of opportunities that can be provided from the, from the sort of small to the spectacle where ideas can be it tested out. And I think the role that, that arts organizations today can play is not so much, as I said early in my talk, being a presenting arts organization, but being the vehicle for the discourse to enable that to happen. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just excited to be able to have this, this conversation. And I think it's a really pertinent time um, between all of the dialogues that are going on about what the future of San Francisco will be and the future of cities will be, the future of art will be, and the future of technology will be, we sort of get to talk about all of them at the same time, which is cool. Um, I think in, in urban planning, there's a lot of talk about alternative future scenarios. It's one of the few fields where you get to look at what the future would be like in 30 years and start today and see seven different paths that would get you to seven different places. And we're sort of at that point now for, for the arts and for what they represent in the Bay Area. Um, I think there's one alternative future where the Bay Area becomes the home for digital art in the world. And that's expressed beautifully in public space. And the tech companies understand the value of that and they support it and they create beautiful visualizations and interactive projects on the streets. And that's very representative of one of the San Francisco's that um, exists today and could exist in the future. Um, but those, the balance between these types of projects, I think, is really important. And Ben Davis, uh, in talking about the Baylights, uh, speaks a lot about the importance of getting past novelty, that it's not a technology project. It's an art project, and it's an aesthetic experience. Um, and the technology enables that, and it would not have been possible without that. And the fact that the lights um, you know, are different every single time you look at them and will never be the same in the life of the project is, is a testament to that. And, it's, and that is an artistic decision. Um, um, but the importance of getting past this novelty technology for technology's sake, I think, can't be um, overstated. And that, that's the difference between good and meaningful digital art and meaningful public art um, that uses these tools and things that are going to be shiny for a year or two and then lose their value. So you, you either have the option of building, embedding this kind of changeability, adaptability for these projects to adapt at the speed of culture and the speed of technology, or having the foresight to understand and to build something like the Baylights that's uh, much more uh, timeless, in my opinion, or you know, in 30 years, it will still be a beautiful project, you know, even though like LEDs are not, you know, we've had them for a while, right? They're not the most current thing, but that, that's not the point, you know? So, you know, some thoughts. <laughs> I'd love to ask a, just a, a short, simple question before we move on to the to the room, I'm, um, because I'm actually much more interested in everyone else's question. But I'd love love for you to expand a little bit on um, 
the, the, the kind of perceived neutrality of technology, um, which is to say that, you know, the, the, especially in uh, barrier culture, we see technology either as neutral or a, as, a, as a good thing, uh, and, and the, with some uh, opposing voices. But the, the um, but technology is actually very political as well, uh, and we're we're seeing it increasingly in the in our larger national conversation. And so, what what are the politics of technological art in public space? And and uh, just speaking from your own experience, how how does how do those politics become present, and how do you manage them as 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 kind of intermediaries between uh, uh, the the powerful and those who 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 aren't so much? There are no innocents yeah. in um, anything. I mean, I, I view every artistic action as a political action. Um, so I, I think that you know, the, you know, from the from the from the artist's selection of, of the conceptual area that they're going to operate in, to the tools that, they, that are utilized, to the delivery of the experience, all of those things have. Um, a politics to them that has to be navigated. And part of the role of, a, of an organization and the, from the curatorial you know, vantage point is certainly to put a lens on how to best contextualize those relationships um, in such a way that they, they, they lead to uh, an artistic result, not just a result. And the it's a very difficult task because with a lot of public art, as you well know, I mean, there, there are many, many stakeholders involved in, in the decision processes. And there, there does tend to be a kind of movement towards neutrality or, or even, you know, just a dumbing down of, of, of the works, I think, is, is something that we, we continuously try to avoid happening, but it's, it's always partially there. And I think we have to admit that. Um, I think Deborah said, said early, you know, in the first presentation that uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, getting getting 80 percent there is better than not getting there at all. And I think that that we see a lot of that. And uh, um, I would never make the claim ever that uh, you know our organization is producing definitive kinds of outcomes and results that are the the uh, typification of what things should be. They're at best stabs in the dark. And 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 occasionally, you know, you 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 hit you, you hit the mark correctly, but boy, there's a lot of failure in the process as well. So I think part of the discourse is illuminating this this particular er area of of debate and using the artworks as a kind of backdrop for that debate to occur. So, yeah. yeah, and I think a lot of the the, the, where the antagonistic um, uh, debate that's happening currently has stemmed from is the fact that there, there hasn't been a forum for reasonable debate to take place. So this is becoming a, re a reflection of sort of the internet itself where you can put a comment anywhere and not really respond to the person that you're commenting to or not say it to their face. Um, <laughs> And that same interface, I think, is really important between traditional artists and, and new media artists. Um, I think the Graffiti Research Lab is a beautiful example of that type of collaboration. Um, they basically, among other things, have used laser pointers to be able to uh, draw on the sides of buildings, digital graffiti. Um, so you pop a projector up there, uh, point your laser at it, do your tags as you would, and all of those get saved as they're happening. So they exist afterwards, but they're also ephemeral. So in some ways, you know, some of these projects could be less political because they're temporary by definition, and you can just turn the projector off at the end of the night. Um, but again, getting into the specifics of, of specific technologies, there's a lot of uh, interactive pieces that do have to be permanent and that would potentially take the place of another art piece in, a, in, a, in an area with limited space. I mean, if you've tried to get a mural on the wall anywhere in San Francisco, the politics kind of speak for themselves. Um, so, so I think like understanding where, where technology can help break down some of these barriers, but also um, uh, become, become something that inspires dialogue rather than, uh, re inspires meaningful dialogue rather than counterproductive dialogue. Yeah. Let's open it up for, for questions. 
in the back there. Um, and I guess I have a question. I think this is mainly for you, Jake. Um, I'm, you know, you sort of touched on the, the sort of problems of access with this kind of technology, and you were talking about access for the makers, but I'm, I'm wondering also about access for the participants. Um, you know, it sort of seems to me in a lot of these projects that you have like these sort of things that are based on like take your phone out of your pocket and scan this QR code, and it just requires not only to, that you own the technology, but that you also have sort of a level of fluency with it, and, and, and I'm just wondering, you know how how you feel this connects to sort of some of the some of the kind of community development aims we've talked about and sort of the digital divide, which is a big part of of kind of I think the the community struggles in San Francisco. You know, do, does do technology projects kind of address that, worsen that? You know, uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a that's a great point, and I think um, it's I, design is a word that we haven't used a lot um, in this conversation yet. But it sits somewhere between the two, um, art and technology, in terms of understanding the experience, understanding the audience, and designing a project for that audience. And to put a project in uh, a neighborhood with little access that requires digital access to participate in is, is a terrible idea. I think we can all agree. Um, but you know, take the the Pulse of the City project for example, or uh, a fa the project Faces by Theo Watson, which just required that you walk up to a camera. Uh, as soon as you walked up to it, it counted down three seconds and took your picture and projected it uh, as a thirty foot tall image on the side of a building uh, across the street, um, and then saved all of those images to a public gallery. Something beautiful and simple like that. Um, a lot of technological interactions are extremely simple and actually made that way by, by design and, and have no barrier to, to entry um, in the sense that everyone has you know, a hand that they can wave and move around. You, you know, if the instructions are done, done properly and if it's intuitive enough, um, I think that that design question is is really really important, and it's really it's much easier to do wrong than to do right. Um, it's much easier to be like, oh, we have this amazing project. It's like a visualization on the side of a wall, and you know people are going to pull out their phones, and it's like going to collect all this data, and it'll be cool. But um, you know, at the end of the day, what's the point? You know, getting past again the shininess and the aesthetic. Uh, or the newness of something for the sake of being new versus like something that can really actually tap the community. And that, that Faces project, it turned the corner of 6th and Market into a really active, you know, we worked on the ground floor in that corner for um, a few years and we saw a lot of things um, happen <laughs> um, that are not worth maybe repeating. No, but it, it completely changed the corner. I mean, there were fights there. There were um, there was a lot of drug deals there. There was a lot of uh, public defecation and all these sorts of things. And not to say like, you know, those things are patently wrong and the people that do them are patently like bad or anything. But just in, in terms of like changing the face of a community, I think that was a really great example of of placemaking. Actually, it actually changed the place by by making. Uh, an option for people to engage with. Teresa. Okay, for our few words list, I think that from this panel today we have connectivity, reciprocity, participatory projects. But I'd like to go back to uh, Nicola's question about the politics of technology, because as someone who studies technology of surveillance, that's what I do, how technology is used for purpose of security, surveillance, militarization. I get very nervous when I don't see uh, this side of the story, when you are creating projects that can locate us, that can follow us, can transmit data about whatever we're doing to some cloud or some center uh, who knows who controlled this data, who knows what's going to be done with this data. So I just wanted to ask you to reflect a little bit on this other side of the same technology, which is the one that allows us to be constantly surveilled. Excellent uh, uh, question. What, in, in my presentation, I was, I was attempting to point out what I, I would argue is a, a certain level of an inevitability 
that's going that is occurring with the uh, ubiquity of uh, the direction or trajectory specifically around um, what we think of as the internet, which is really this this, this networked culture and society that you know we are moving to ever increasing levels of of um, of uh, connectivity, and uh, I, and I use the 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 the, the adjective uh, radical connectivity very very intentionally. Um, absolutely, it's it's not a you know uh, uh, it's an and or proposition. The dangers of of all technologies are ever present. They are all swords. They can all be used for harm and danger, and they're all political. Um, ever so much more the reason artists need to be involved now in providing a kind of critical examination, um, a uh, helping make more transparent what these technologies may or may not hold in store for us, and proposing maybe alternative trajectories for how they might play out. Now, I, I realize that, how, you know, that this is a very complicated terrain and something that all of us need to, as citizens, need to be more actively aware of and engaged. But I would almost bet most of us do not fully comprehend the scope of, for, for example, what NSA has been doing, is continuing to do, and will continue to do in the future, unless checked. And where does the check come from? I think it comes from the arts as a kind of cultural, um, if you will, watchdog, to, to some, some extent. I'm not putting that responsibility totally on, on the artist. I don't think it's, it's, that's the case. But without the arts as part of that conversation, I think we're, we're, we're really um, doing ourselves a disservice. Um. I was just going to very quickly be an advocate for surveillance. Um, no. <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, the, there, I think uh, the data collection from these projects is one of the most important pieces of them. How many people here have ever been asked about the data behind their projects or the impact behind their projects or the number of people that engage with them or the times of day that they engage or how much economic development it creates or how much pedestrian activity it generates you know we we can now track all of those things as the good people you know on the on the in nonprofits in the art sector and and i think that's really valuable and for example just with the, the Pulse project of having five of them around the city, now we know, you know the average and uh, median pulse rates of, of people at five different sections of the city. Like maybe some of them are rushing around and they're higher. Some of them are at the top of a hill, so people are worn out. Um, and how many people engage with them at exactly what time of day. And that's like, that's I think the benefit of, uh, if there could ever be a positive side of you know uh, ubiquitous surveillance, it's that we can um, use some of the same technology to, to help our own causes. Um, yeah, that doesn't mean we're tracking everyone's like movements and following them into their house and all these, you know, it's all anonymous. So again, a design question, are you gonna? Somebody else is doing yeah. that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> That's being taken care of. Um, Question in the front first, then. Hi, um, I'm Ava Roy. I'm with We Players. I'll be contributing to this conversation in a, a different way later after after lunch. I have a bunch of sort of scattered thoughts that I'm going to try to cobble together into a question, but more I'm just going to ask you to, to muse a little bit on the art uh, part of it. Um, and sort of riffing off what you just said, Teresa, um, part of what I'm hearing is that if tech is going to be, and it is, a huge part of our lives, then artists should be at the table. That's come up a couple times today. Um, that artists need to be there as part of the check, which is kind of something you were just saying, and also focusing the, the direction and how we use tech and how we relate to it. So I get all that. I guess I'm curious to, um, to hear you muse a little bit on how this type of art elevates us. Um, and actually helps 
us move beyond our smaller self and our individual self and helps us to connect with our larger sense of self. And if I uh, dare say it in this room, our divine self, because I actually feel like art, that's, that's probably for me one of the most fundamental fundamentally important parts of art is, is moving us past our individual self and past my face appearing 30 feet on a, on a wall because I took a quick snapshot of myself on my phone. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm, I'm curious about that, that how this type of art, and I have some initial thoughts based on some of the examples you saw, so um, uh, that you gave rather. Um, but how this type of art doesn't just impress us with its magnitude or its incredibly uh, overwhelming data collection, but actually how it, um, it moves us beyond the everyday and into this larger sense of, of self and helps us think beyond this kind of limited human capacity um, and connects us to the stream of artists since the ancients, since the very beginning. And for me, that's what I'm curious about, how more technologically uh, motivated art could um, how that might work, how that might actually move us further along this 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 path, rather than I feel like there's some sort of divide between. Um, well, I think I've sort of gotten my, my basic uh, thought out. So if you could muse on that, I, I'd love it. Well, I, I, part of the, part of your assumption is that art is does that. Right, and, and um, <laughs> I think there, there's a, there are other lenses that certainly can be applied, but sort of, you know, trying to address that, your, your particular comment. Um, I do think that the art can be transformational on the individual level or on a community level when it achieves the, um, it achieves a result that shifts the context and understanding of a con sort of the c contemporary circumstance in some way that, that opens up a different way of thinking about one's relationship with the world or a relationship with that community or a relationship with oneself. Um, I think art on occasion does that. You know, not all art does that, of course, but some of it does. And I think it's not a, a burden that's a particularly on technological art. It's, it applies to all art. And I, I know very, very few artists, quite honestly, who think of themselves as tech, technology artists. It's not really an issue for them at all. They're artists. And, and the technology is, it's, it's, I wouldn't classify it as just a, a tool or a media, because it's much more than that. It's a cultural phenomena, and that's what they're playing with. And when, and when they experiment, experiment with it, that leads to results that are transformative. I think that's a huge success. I mean, it's fantastic when that happens. Although I think art can also function in different ways um, that it really isn't about that particular ambition. It could, be, it could function as a, you know, in, in a political sense, or it could function in a in, in, in another way. Yeah, I think that uh, you touched on this spectrum of the space between individuality and collectivity. And I think a lot of these pieces also do that. It, they can be either hyper individualistic, um, you know, in the sort of model that uh, our, our social media worlds have become, where, where we're all our own celebrity. Um, and then on the other side, we can be one data point in a stream of 10 billion data points um, where all, all of our entire presence and existence on this planet is a blue dot on a globe somewhere um, with some numbers attached to it. And, and a lot of these pieces exist somewhere you know, in between those two extremes, but I think both of those are uh, you know, can be as interesting from an artistic perspective as they are dangerous from a cultural perspective, if that makes sense. Um, I think whenever humans become statistics, problems like arise because we're not taking each other for who we are, we're not valuing each individual. At the same time, if everyone is staring at their own phone wrapped up in their own life, that's the other end of the spectrum. Um, so I think hitting that, that sweet spot as an artist is also really important. Um, and exploring projects that hit on both of those points and everything in between. I, I think we're, I 
we're just about at time. One more, One more question. Yeah. Um, yes, quickly. Um, it's about the temporality of. Could you just of, tell us who you are? Oh, you? yes, sorry. sorry. Uh, my name is Nathalie Maté. I'm a digital media artist. Um, I was wondering, um, because we are talking of public spaces and the fact that tech art is really uh, obsolete, you know, next year, uh, and many of those pieces that have, were made 10 or 5 years ago are not, don't exist anymore. Um, like, how do you deal with this issue when you negotiate or when, you know, like for public space, which basically might be looking more at traditional art, might, you know, like a sculpture or a painting or a mural might stay there for a really long time. Is, is there like a new approach to with tech art um, in public spaces? All tech art is, is necessarily temporal in the sense of on the day, off tomorrow. You know, uh, I, I, I think temporality and public art in general is an open-ended question. Uh, you know, uh, short of it being bronze and you know, sticking it there for eternity. Um, I think a, a lot of artists are, are working in different timescales with their with their work. You know, that that ranges from you know the immediate to the short term to you know several years or or, or even decades. And often the, the works are designed in such a way to um, have mechanisms of support that enable them to evolve or transform or um, be caretaken in appropriate ways to update or upgrade them. So I, I think it's just, a, it, it, it's an interesting question, but I think it, it really depends on the specificity of the particular work and the site and the politics and the stakeholders and how that's being approached. Bay Lights is kind of, a, I think, an interesting example in that, that regard because you know it was designed to be a two-year uh, duration project. You know, the first thing that happened when it goes up is, oh, it's got to stay up there forever. You know, well, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> per personally, I'm not so sure about that. But, it'll, you know, it could very likely end up being, in, you know, several, you know, maybe it's up there for a decade. I don't know. Um, but there, there are ways to resolve those things. And if one looks back through, through, through history and looks at other kinds of technologies, say the technology of the clock, and there are clocks that have lasted a very, very long time. And I, I think we're resolving ways in which to, to uh, you know, address those kinds of issues. Yeah, I, I like the, I was thinking of the long now clock when you yeah. said that question. Yeah. So it's like the 10,000 year art piece. Um, but I think the, the policy behind this stuff is, is one of the most important components because without policy that's dynamic enough to embed implicitly in it cultural and technological change, none of this will be possible to the extent that it needs to be to maintain relevancy. Um, so in the, in the nine months that it took to go from a prototype of one of these projects to a realized version on the street that's you know vandal proof and weatherproof and all this stuff, you know, there, there could be a completely new hardware component that was designed in that time and that changes the design of the project and maybe even changes how in, people interact with it. Um, so in terms of, in terms of uh, working with what's, what's there, um, you know, if, if these types of works are, are going to be current and going to be relevant to the communities that they exist in and, um, the, and the artists that create them, um, policy has to move faster. Um, and, and we're working on that a little bit at the city now. We just launched a project called Living Innovation Zones that's designed to embed constant change within specific areas of the city. Um, we're actually working with the Exploratorium on the first one on 4th and Market Street uh, that we're really excited about. And basically, our job is to make it easy for them to have free reign uh, creatively over that space uh, from the beginning and then also as the, as the project goes on. Um, there's more information on that at sfliz.com. Uh, end plug there. <laughs> so, so can, can, can I, I add one last? Really good, I'll be very quick. Um, let's also take into consideration that the, you know, the art is not something that, ne that necessarily has to come at the end <laughs> you know, of, of these design processes. Um, 
I think cities can become much more liquid. And, you know, that essentially, you know, this idea of building it and they will come phenomena is, I think, you know, a thing of the past. So we, we, we really have an opportunity here to have the arts in, engaged in the evolution and design of what a future city or future environment might, might be. And that environment doesn't have to be static. It doesn't have to be architecture as we know it. So anyway. And, and we need to think about art as a research, as part of the research of process, so, which is very um, fitting for this, this group. So, yeah, well, I think yep. this, uh, just to wrap up with two sentences, I think the, the, you know, the last couple of questions especially have turned us towards, say, in the case of Teresa's questions, the crucial difference between transparency and communication, which is a huge debate around data in public life at the moment, or the, the, the notion uh, of, the, of the fundamental, the, the, the city's resilience and permanence, but the, the necessary ephemerality of everything in it that must go along with that, much as architects like to imagine everything's permanent. The, um, I, I think that the, the, and these are really fundamental questions, not just of art or of technology, but the city itself. So it probably indicates we've come to a, a good point to, to, to continue the conversation over lunch uh, and later on this afternoon. So th thank you, everyone. And is there any other logistical announcements? Um, well, first of all, let's thank this fabulous panel. <laughs> <laughs>